This is Mitch, and welcome to the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast. Man, I'm, we're going to be talking about reinvention today. Uh, I, I'm, we're going to be talking to Nomi Yaw, and, and it's, it's y'all, right? Not, all of a sudden, it's, I had a panic like it was yay, but it's y'all. Nomi Yaw. It's ya. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and she wrote this book, From Notes to Notes, uh, How I Went from Music to Real Estate. And so, um, Nomi... Nomi is a professional musician her whole life, decides she needs to reinvent herself and decides she's going to go into real estate somewhere, somehow, gets out there, starts looking at all the different options, narrows it down to this guy named Mitch Steven, who she thinks is brilliant, just brilliant with his owner finance strategy and creating notes out of thin air. And I, <laughs> she called the guy up one day and he said, you know, maybe we could be teacher-student relationship and we, I could teach you how to do this. And she said, okay, I'm in. So then she said yes, and she started studying. This, lady's a peri- uh, this lady is a prolific studier. She's kind of way into the details. I don't think of musicians as that detailed. And I suppose there's all different kinds of musicians, but I suppose if you're having to read those little bitty dots on a page as they go by at like one point, whatever seconds per second, then, you know, you have to be kind of detailed. So we're talking about, let's talk about the book first, and then we'll talk about, I don't know, whatever we want to talk about. Uh, hi, Nomi. How you doing? I'm doing great, Mitch. All Thanks right, for so, leaving me that great review on Amazon. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was good. You know, I, I got like a hair's breadth away from the end of the book, but it was already good. So I'm going to finish like the last little bit here. Um, I actually uh, saw my name in the book a couple times. Thank you very much. But by the way, that's not why we're doing this because my name's in the book. We're doing it because it was a good book and this person really reinvented themselves. And I think there's a whole bunch of people out there in in the world that would or should contemplate reinventing themselves right now because they're not really happy with what they're doing. I'm going to put this down in a minute, but there's what it looks like one more time. And that's how you spell her name. And that's how, you know, because it's not the most regular name in the world. Nomi Ya. Yeah. How many of those do you know? Not very many. (laughs) Um, so, okay. Give us the bullet points of your life. Bring us up to you sitting here in front of me. Well, that's partly why I wrote the book because my life was quite long and meandering. And so people would always say, give me an elevator pitch. And I'd be like, I don't know where to start with this. So that was one of the reasons I wrote the book is to be able to kind of give people that background of where I came from, because it kind of, it kind of was a long story. Don't you think? (laughs) Yeah, they're all, we're all long stories. It is. Yeah, it's true. Um, I guess if you've done one thing your whole life, it makes it easier. But I did do 25 years of music, touring around the world and doing different things. But as you can imagine, music, like I know you're a songwriter. And at a certain point in your life, you looked, you weighed, should I do songwriting or should I do real estate? And you're like, well, the money is really in the real estate. And I kind of went the other way. And so now that I'm went through the music world. Now I'm back going, you know, real estate's really where the money is. (laughs) Well, I mean, let's face it. There's some big money in the music business. If, if, if if you're the right person at the right time and I don't know it, you can kind of force your success in real estate. It's it's really hard to force yourself sometimes in the music business because it's just a, a, a very tenuous business, right? Well, if you're on the road touring and performing, it's a, it's a way to make a living. But when you think of it like in, you take away the glamour of the music industry and you just call it a job, you're out there working a job. And as soon as you stop, the money stops. You know, so, I mean, I have had some songs that have done really well and I get royalties, but I can get a um, 100,000 spins on, you know, listens and make $2. It's just ridiculous industry. Well, the other thing is, is, you know, people say, wow, you got paid, you know, 500 bucks and you played for two hours. You know, no, that's not, that wasn't, it took me a three hour plane ride to get here. It'll take me a three hour plane ride to get back. I had to practice this song for hours and hours and hours, you know, with the band. I stayed in a hotel last night, you know, so, you know what I mean? Like if you really, you're getting paid for a gig, but it takes a lot to get to that gig. You know what I mean? So I, I, 
I actually coach a lot of artists and what I tell them, I'm a young artist in their teens and 20s. And, I'll, and what I tell them is like, if you love music as an artist, just do music as an artist and get another way of making a living. But if you want to make a living, that's like a real job, job, job. You're out there doing it 100% of the time. You can barely keep a family together or anything else together. It's a brutal lifestyle. That's what I looked at. I looked at, okay, so I'm supposed to get five cents every time my, my song is played on the radio. Who the hell's keeping track of that and how do I know? You, you don't get five cents. You get like three, three, three and a half cents or something stupid. And that's only when it's playing on the radio. And, and if it's playing streaming online, it's a fraction of that. Yeah, so I, I was just looking at the metrics and going, you know, and then I'm supposed to get... What is it? A nickel every time you you get a side or you get a cut or you you know you're pressed on a it used to be album but now it's a CD or whatever and you used to get a little bit for that. I said, well, how do I know how many how how do I really know how long that run was? How many did they really print? You know, how many did they stamp out? I don't know. So I just I said, you know, I'll go buy a house and I'll keep music as like the last bastion of my childhood and I'll just do it for fun. Well, actually, you are a very good musician, a very good songwriter. And I think that songwriting, if you can just do your art as art itself, it's, it can be your lifelong vocation and career without necessarily forcing it to make money. Well, I've been trying to write a good song for 40 years. I like to tell everybody I'm going to, I'm going to get good at it like any day now. So, uh, <laughs> no, actually, you're very good. <laughs> if you're interested in, this, in, in, in a chronological biographical discography of songs by Mitch Steven, go to MitchStevenMusic.com and there you can listen to your heart's content. You got a music, you have a music site out there? Uh, yes, I'm at Song Brigade slash Nomi. Uh. Song Brigade.com slash Nomi? Yeah, or you can just put my name in Google and you'll find all kind of stuff popping up. <laughs> so you wrote this famous song uh, that we've heard in church forever back when you were like 13 or 14 years old. I got that out of your book, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was that? What's the name of that song? The song is called King of Kings and uh, it's, it's performed by a ton, a ton of people all over the world. It's been translated into a bunch of languages. Uh, it's considered sort of a staple, like a amazing grace or something, but I don't get paid for any of that because uh, when people sing in a church, you don't get paid. Uh, the only way I get paid is if they print it on the, um, what do you call the little music books that they put in the pews? Yeah, if I get it. Hymnals? Yeah, if it's in a hymnal, now you can look for King of Kings in a hymnal, and you probably, you know, I'm in a lot of them. <laughs> so I get paid for that. Um, and I got paid when Petra recorded it, and they got a gold record. So I got paid from the record. But I don't get paid for the performances in church, which is fine. I don't mind. But how crazy is that that Petra recorded King of Kings, your, your gospel song? I know. <laughs> okay, so you're going along in the music business. Did you make a good living, living a fair living? Did you eke by? T tell us about that time of your life. Oh, no, I made, uh, you know, maybe the first couple of years were tough, but I made a really good living. I mean, I'm, I mean, probably like got up to about $700, to $1,000 a show, or I'd be paid blanket, you know, like, seven to 10 grand a, a month. So I was making pretty good money and getting some royalties and getting side jobs uh, and recording studios and writing. So, you know, as long as you're out there on the road, you're making money. I mean, I was, but as soon as you want to get off the road, so that's what happened when I became a single mom, I wanted to get off the road. And when I got there, off the road- There was your angst, you had a kid. Yeah, I had a kid, I became a single mom. And when I became a single mom, I had to, I just decided I had to get off the road. Either, either that or he was going to get raised by a bunch of people that weren't me. You couldn't, you just couldn't put him like a papoose on your back and just carry him around? I did uh, include in the book the part of the story where I tried to take him on tour with me. <laughs> it, was, it was a little rough because I had to drive my own, my own vehicle behind the tour bus. Because if he was in the tour bus, they're all drinking alcohol and smoking weed and smoking cigarettes and swearing and talking about who knows what. And I can't stop them and make them all childproof. So I had to drive my own vehicle. And that's a lot of work when you, work, when you perform at night and you drive all day. Oh, yeah. That, that, uh, this can't happen. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I, won't, I won't mention any names here, but I was on the tour bus of a very prominent, well-known 
band one time. Uh, I, I, I knew I knew one of the players, and and uh, he invited me to ride to the show at the Niagara Falls Amphitheater uh, one night because I, I just happened to be staying in a hotel right across the street from where the band was staying, and I saw the band and I called my friend and he said, "Get on this bus, we're leaving." And <clears throat> I got on there. The strangest dichotomy. One guy was drinking whiskey straight out of a bottle. We're all sitting at the same table, just about, right around. Another guy was smoking a joint. Another guy was reading the Bible and did not drink nor smoke. And another person was drinking, uh, uh, I don't know, his favorite beverage and Coke. And, and, uh, and everyone was just letting everybody live and let live. Yeah, it's, which is great. It's great as adults, but as a kid, it's a little different. Okay, so you decide to get off the road because you have this responsibility and this ache in your heart to not leave him alone. Right. You want to be with him. And rightfully so. So how scary is that? Oh, it's extremely scary because I had really spent every moment of my waking life from the time I was a, you know, a young teenager working on this one goal. How do I become a successful musician? How do I get on tour? How do I get something on someone's album? You know, write another song, do another thing. And my whole orientation was around success in the music business. So dropping that and suddenly having nothing was like this giant abyss. It's like you had this huge master's or doctorate degree in something and all of a sudden now you're just throwing it right in the trash. Exactly. And then what it turned out is I wasn't I wasn't uh, able to get another job because people would be like, well, wh where's your resume? I feel like I don't have a resume unless you want to count the different 20 bands I played with in the last few years. But so I couldn't get a job, even a low paid job in a coffee shop. It was, it was very difficult doing that transition. And you know, going on the road and doing all those bookies and handling that stuff's pretty damn sophisticated. I mean, yeah. you know, like certainly you could make coffee at the barista, but you, you don't have the resume. So they're not going to, you can't explain, you know, you, you played in a band. Well, that's not, you know, well, like I said, there's a lot more to playing in a band than playing in a band. You've got to map yeah. out logistics for God knows what equipment and everything else, you know? So. Yeah. Plus I was a recording engineer, so I can do that technical stuff you were talking about at the beginning. I have that whole side. You know, all that stuff is a lot of, there's, there's a lot to, to being a musician. Now, people tend to write us off as just a bunch of partiers, but I mean, some of us are. <laughs> yeah. I suppose you have your spurts. Um, so, so, but did you have to, was there a way to come home and still do something, you know, give piano lessons or something? Was there a way to still drag in some money while you were trying to reinvent yourself? Yeah, I wasn't good at piano lessons because you're always going back to those same beginners, and I just found it very frustrating. Um, but I did make a living, still make a living to this day, doing writing songs, doing stuff in my recording studio. Um, I, get, I get stuff on people's albums. I get stuff on, on film and TV. And uh, I do artist coaching and, um, you know, stuff like that. So I, I do make a living still to this day. I still get royalties. It's just not, it, like you were saying at the beginning, it's not something that I can control. I can just keep throwing myself at it and things will happen, but I can't really control it. Like if I go and create a note, I'm actually in control of that stream of money. For a while anyway, huh? Mm -hmm. um, so then you started looking around. What all, what, what all did you consider doing when you were trying to reinvent yourself and get off this road? What all went through your mind? What, 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 did, you, what did you give a chance to or what did you consider? Gosh, I thought of everything. You know, I did think of, I did start doing piano lessons and thought about doing that kind of stuff in music. I, I ran a, a club for a while. I did, tried to do something in music. And then I thought about buying a franchise like a Subway sandwich or something. I mean, I, I really, my mind went all over the place trying to come up with something. Um, pretty much everything I tried didn't really work. Uh, you can read it in my book. I, I did start a successful business. Um, doing um, office organizing and document organizing for people. Um, I did some other things before I really got into real estate. What brought, so what, what pulled you over to the real estate side? When, was, when did that, when did real estate just start to raise its head? Well, it started back, um, I'm going to say when I first became a single mom and I, I got a divorce, I bought my own house. I converted part of my house into an apartment, a separate apartment. 
And when I did that, I could rent it out. And then the rent paid for my entire house note. And that's when it started being like, whoa, I'm making a lot of money off of this and not doing anything once I set it up. And so that's kind of what started my, my interest. I actually was interested in real estate since I was a child. I kept looking at real estate. I just didn't know what to do with it, but I've always been interested in it. That was like me. I had, I bought my own place with the owner seller, the, 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 the seller financed me it was $28,000. It was an efficiency apartment. Uh, right by the pool and it got kind of small or it seemed, you know, a, a place came up down the way that was a two bedroom, two bath, two story vaulted ceiling, had a fireplace and a sunken living room. And I thought, wow, I think I could move over there. I rented out my first place and then I moved into that place and then I rented out the spare bedroom and I was actually making money to live, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. my life, not, 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 not much different than yours. Uh, like, Know me and Mitch, we got to get hit in the head with a baseball bat before we understand the concept. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and then um, I started getting afraid, you know, about special assessments. And if they came up with one of these, you know, seven or eight or nine or $10,000 special assessments to fix a roof, because what I had really bought was a condo. Uh, uh, if they came up with any of these special assessments, they were going to crush me because I had very little savings. And now I had two condos and heaven forbid, both of them come up with a special assessment. And I got scared because, but there wasn't any special assessments in the horizon at that point, but it, I, I got brought to my attention that it could happen. And uh, I started looking at how old the roofs were and they were gonna need something within the future, cl close future. I, so I went and sold them all and I made, I looked up one day and I had like $45,000 in the bank. I mean, like I, I went to this place and I signed some papers and I came back and my bank account was, had $45,000 in it, something like that. And that's when my light bulb went off. I said, holy hell, that's like more than I make in a year of working every day, you know, all the yeah. time, 365 days. And that's way more than that I even make. And it just happened in like the stroke of a couple of pins over here in this room. How do you make that happen again? And that's when I started studying. Is that like, yeah. that like sounds like you. Yeah, and actually, because uh, I started before that apartment, I started, uh, I bought my first house in the 90s, and then uh, I found a house for 90 grand in California. And then by the time I sold it, it was worth 150. So I was like, how did I make that much money in just a few years? I didn't know what appreciation and all that was. And I was like, that is an unbelievable amount of money for doing nothing but just living in the house. So yeah, all those things started, I started going, you know, compared to the 3.5 cents I'm making off of this song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 3.5 cents I'm making off this song. That's why they said they'll let you, let you have it for a song, you know, basically it's, <laughs> it's not worth much, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so Still, you're in the real estate. Did you buy a course, go to a seminar? I mean, what were the first, what was the first, like, I'm going to get serious about this. Like, where did you, which direction did you go when you decided I need to look into this or I need to pursue it? Well, that was actually only a few years ago that I really started. Well, no, it was like about four or five years ago. I started saying, you know what? I really need to do more real estate, but I couldn't figure out how. I was like, if only I could buy a multifamily or, or just another house that wasn't my own house that could just purely be income, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. Because as you can imagine, being, being a musician on the road, you're not going to be able to get a bank loan. I, I still to this day can't get a bank loan to save my life. I really can't. Um, so it, I couldn't. It may, be, it may have been your greatest asset because when you can't get a bank loan, you learn how to do something else. Yeah, exactly. Something else might be better than get the bank loan in the first place, you know? Yeah. So what I did is it took me a couple of years and I kept talking about it and thinking about it and, and, you know, and it wasn't until my dad came along and said, I got this old property. I don't know what to do with. Can you help me? Cause I know you're interested in real estate. So it's one of those things of you prepare, prepare, prepare. And then when the opportunity comes, you're ready to take that opportunity because he literally offered this to my other brothers and they didn't know what to do with it. I know what to do with it. They didn't so, take They tried to figure out what to do with it. They couldn't figure it out. 
because it was like, well, we could sell it, but, but then what? And my dad's a doctor. He was like, I don't need the money. You know, what are you going to do with the money? And I had this whole concept. Oh, we'll buy a multifamily unit and we'll split the profit. And I just came out with this plan. So we like we, your enthusiasm. Yeah. And also I had had some experience. So he was, okay, let's try this. So I put this property up and we couldn't get a loan. Um, it, it didn't have a water source. You had to drive in with a water truck and had all these issues. It wasn't a real house. It was like a big warehouse. Um, so we, my, my real estate agent said, hey, why don't you do seller financing? That was my first time I ever heard of owner financing. And so we did it. And then I was like, wow, that was easy. And then that money started flowing in. And then I was like, wow, I'm getting paid. Let's back up. Just sort of, you know, a lot of you guys caught it real fast. You guys are fast studies. Some, some of the people on this call, you know, they may be listening for the first time about some of these concepts. Mm -hmm. She couldn't sell it because a bank wouldn't loan on it because the property just didn't fit in the bank's box. You know, they got these little check marks they got to make and it didn't have a water source and it was a warehouse and the bank said no. That's, I, you, I could probably have predicted that the bank wouldn't make a loan on it. And you may have had to go out there and find out that they wouldn't, but anyways. So then the, you think, okay, well, this property is not worth anything. I'm dead in the water which is what a lot of people do, which is one way you find some deals is people get to one roadblock and they think, well, the property's not worth anything. And then they walk away, they sell it to someone like me or know me. And then we say, you know, I can solve the financing problem. I'll just finance it myself. And then you put the price way back up to where it should have been. And then you make payments. You, yes. you sell it to someone and let them make you a down payment and payments. And that's what you right. did. Right? So, yes. how, so how much did you get? T tell us a deal on that property if you can remember the numbers more or less. Um, well, we sold the property. I think it was about one hundred eighty-five thousand because it really was. It, it has an ocean view, believe it or not, a tiny little peak of the ocean. So you'd think, man, California that should be really valuable. But the property was really like so funky. I can't even like. I can't even emphasize that enough. It was really bad. It was made out of like corrugated tin and it had, you know, rusting holes in it. And I couldn't even get someone to get up on the roof to fix the roof because it was so rickety. They wouldn't even send someone up there. So they threw a big tarp over it. It was, it's, it was in bad condition. So, um, so you own our finance for eight, 185,000 zero down or how much do you get? Down? No, no, we, we financed, uh, I, they put down about 60,000. I think our, our owner finance note was 115,000. And what rate and how long? I could only, um, well, originally I could only get, um, 6% because Californians, they, they really focus on the interest rate. And so I was like, okay, well, let's just raise the price a little and lower the interest rate a little. But now what I've done is I've re my dad wanted to do a five year balloon because he was like, yeah, I don't want to do it forever. Let me just do five years. I think older people type type of thing. They don't want to think that far. Um, so what I did is at a certain point, he assigned the whole note to me. I restructured the note, which is something I really recommend is I took the balloon out and turned it into a 30 year note, but I upped the interest rate to 7.75. So now it's a 30 year note at 7.75. Which is great because the, the first five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of that, they're not going to pay anything down. Exactly. So free run at it. I don't know. Pretty smart. So I'm going to guess that your, uh, your father was impressed with your, with your on your feet thinking. Yeah. Okay, so, and then you ended up with that note. I guess he said, you're the only one that cares about it. You're the only one that knew how to do it. You're the only one here. Ha Go ahead and have it. I don't need it. Right? Plus, he, but plus, he knew what I was doing. I kept telling him, I'm starting this note business. So this is part of my business. So he's basically helping me start a business, and, and he still gets some profit off it. But um, Cool. What's the incoming payment? Um. It's well. It was eleven hundred sixty-seven, but when I restructured it, it went down to um, eight hundred and fifty-eight or something like that. I don't have the number in front of me, but okay. So um, that's kind of like one of your first deals. Yeah, that was hey. my very my very first note. Remember your second deal? Um. Well, I I I do. I just um, I don't know if I should talk about that. Um, but I, but I actually have the numbers for the a deal that I'm working on right now, if you're interested in hearing about that. 
Okay, so I bought this property in um, Austin. Um, and this is, this is kind of the model I'm working on right now. So the asking price was 190,000, which was really already below market. We figured the market was 210. And they were selling it for 190 because it was a medical emergency. Um, the woman had lived there forever. You know, she had to be out of the home in a assisted care and the family was just trying to get rid of the property um, to pay for her medical. So we got it, at, they were offering 190, we saw it was 30 grand under, and then we negotiated another 20 grand off. So we bought it for 170. Wow, good job. Now then we improved it, uh, 15, about 15 grand we put into it. So now our cost base is, is 185,000. Um, we're putting it on the market right now, we're, uh, we're offering to sell it at um, 240. The market comps say 230 now because we put the improvements in. And we're selling it for 240 because we're using, this is what I call the MMM, the modified Mitch method. <laughs> okay, tell us about the MMM, the modified Mitch method. Okay, so Mitch method would be the OFV, the owner finance value. So you'd figure out the rent comps are around 1600, the tax and insurance is around 500. So you would take the rent comps 1600, you'd subtract the tax and insurance and you come out with an, uh, a payment that they could afford of 1100 a month, right? P&I payment, yeah. Uh, yeah, so their PI payment is 1100 a month. That gives you an uh, OFV value, if you included a 10% down payment, that gives you an OFV value of 125,000, of 100, 150,000. Okay. And a, because you have a, so, so did you do the math on that or do I need to break that down? No, I, I, I got it. So, I mean, yeah. by the rent formula, backing into the rents, it, it comes out with an OFV of only 150000 Right. So what we do, what I'm doing as a, my MMM is I'm modifying it, and I'm saying I looked at the rents in Austin, and last year they went up $700 and the, year, the average rent, and, and the year before it went up $500 average rent. So what I did is I – said, well, if it goes up another few hundred dollars next year, you know, and then the year after that, who knows how long it keeps going up. I don't have to stick to the current rents. So let me pop on an extra few hundred dollars. That's my modified Mitch method is I throw a few extra dollars onto that rent comp. So, um, so what well, did I come? Yeah. So because, because Austin's an anomaly in Texas, it's like California in the middle of Texas. It has it's it has these whole different dynamics in real estate and rent and it, it it probably will go through a boom and bust cycle like California or San Francisco or Las Vegas or Florida parts of Florida um, because it just skyrockets up and skyrockets towards the bottom when it happens it hasn't happened yet but um, in Austin Austin's just kind of enjoyed this rise so far as it turns into whatever Austin's turning into, which is a techno hub center and a music center, but music's not driving that place. It's the tech the technology businesses. And so you just use a different multiplier to arrive at the price that your, that your people are going to deem as normal in, in Austin, right? You're right. A different multiplier because the multiplier I use 115 to get to the, you know, plus 12% for a down payment is, apparently way low compared to what you can get for yours. I mean, right. what, I guess what we're saying in short is, is in, in my town and in, in the towns around Texas, they usually want to own a house for the same as rent. People in Austin are willing to pay way more to own the house than they could ever rent it for. Right. So in our, in our case, we added about $700 in monthly payment to this. Now, if you, and, and so for we, we don't consider $700 to be that much more than rent if the rents are going up that fast because we're doing a 30-year loan. So just imagine 10 years from now, that $700 is going to disappear. It's, uh, you know, it's probably going to be integrated into what, you know, it's going to be below what rent is, you know, yeah. if it keeps going up. So you, add, you chose to add seven to, to get to your calculations and modify the formula. Right. Uh, that you chose to add $7 to the rent. Seven dollars Seven hundred dollars to the rent that you could prove, so that when you did the math, it would be more in line of what prices were at. Exactly. So, for those of you that don't have the formula, it is you take the rent 
minus the monthly insurance, minus the monthly taxes, times 115 plus 12% equals the OFV or the owner finance value, which is basically figuring out a value based on the rent, um, like a cap rate or like you would a commercial building. You know, your, your cap rates are based on what is the net operating income. We're, we're finding a value of a home based on uh, what is the what is the typical rent for a house just like this in this neighborhood and we're backing into a price that way. Nomi was smart enough to figure out that Mitch's formula doesn't even come close or work remotely in Austin. It doesn't work and, and my formula wouldn't work in New York or, or downtown Los Angeles either. Um, and so she just modified the multiplier. How she did that was she just took the rent and added a bunch of money on top of it before she went through the rest of the equation. Right, exactly. So on, on this particular uh, example that I was giving you, it looks like um, my, if, I, if this thing pays to term, I'm going to make a total of $488,000, you know, over $488,000 over the course of 30 years, which is a 264% return. Yeah. So I don't know about people it's saying you a, can't. It's not an annual return, but it's, you know what I mean? No, that's it annualized. It's 8.880%, 8 yeah. which is still, you know, way better than what you're talking about, a CD uh, or, you know, a long-term treasury bond or something. It's still higher. And there's some good things that can still happen too. I mean, you know, I don't count on it. I don't wish for it. I don't hope for it. But I just got back a house last week that when I let go of it, I was owed a hundred grand. I'm getting it back after s several years and it's worth 250 grand. You know, yeah. I, I don't wish that for anybody. I, I, I would have worked it out if they would have called me, but they just left. They just, they just <laughs> left. They didn't call and say, Hey, can we work something out? Can we nothing? They just left. So wow. nothing I can do about it. And, and, and I didn't even anyways. So so that didn't even actually account for the fact that the second thing I do, which is basically the Mitch method, which is I go get a, a you know, private investor to come in. And so um, I figure that within uh, five to 10 years, I'm going to have my investment completely out. I'm going to have that 185 completely paid back to me within five to 10 years and still give my private investors 8%. So then the last 20 years of the loan, I don't, I never put any money in. It's basically free. And that's how, that's how I'm going to be retiring. Yeah. So you, um, you sold a partial. Is that what you did? I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, which is a rather long, deep, more complicated conversation, which we're not going to get into right now. But the point is we got this lady who was playing in a band one once upon a time and now she's like dealing in millions of dollars of real estate and uh it wasn't that long ago she decided she needed to change and today she's making that happen it's pretty pretty impressive nomi thank you but i i definitely would hope that my book inspires people to do that kind of thing because i think our, there is a lot of people that feel dissatisfied but they're afraid to take a step because there's this big jump without a net thing where you're like, well, you know, this is this life isn't great, but at least I know it. But I would encourage people to to not be so afraid of that abyss, but to sort of step out into it sometimes. Well, and you did the right thing, man. You 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 um you sought a lot of counsel and you studied a lot of people and you read a lot of stuff, didn't you? Yeah, and and I have to say, I know you didn't do this interview for me to give you compliments, but you are a really outstanding teacher and I can't believe like when I when I was first sort of formally learning with you, I just a lot of it didn't fit what I wanted to do. So I got a little frustrated, although some of it really did make me a lot of money, like how to sell a house without an agent and stuff like that. But um, as I've been listening to you for about two years, stuff has soaked in and your wealth of knowledge is really crazy. I things will pop in my head. You're going to come to the conclusions I came to. I'm just trying to shortcut them, but you may have to go through it to, to understand why I think like I do. I tried all that stuff. I know what happens. 
And well, like I just made 200 bucks off of you yesterday. I was in, I'm in escrow and the, the seller said, Hey, can I ask a favor? Can we close a few days early? And my first thing was like, oh, sure, no problem. And then I was like, no, Mitch says, don't ever give something without taking something. So I was like, I couldn't think of what to take. I was like, can you do an extra gardening and, you know, broom sweep it before, you know, the close of escrow? And he's like, sure. So that was probably a couple hundred bucks. So yeah. thanks, Mitch. <laughs> if, uh, if I can, will you, which is, yeah. I invent that. I think Zig Ziglar, or I don't know, one of those, one of those monster negotiators, but, but uh, I just, I just always say, you know, if, if I will, can you, you know, or if, I, if, if, if I can, will you, it's just, you always ask for something in return. Otherwise, well, there's a, there's a lot of details like that. A lot, a lot of little tips that you're giving because you're your wealth of knowledge. So I just, I really encourage people, whether to formally, you know, train with you or just to study your books or, you know, not just you, there's other teachers too, but it's really important to learn. Yeah, there's, you know, I just happen to be a guy who spent 22, 24, I always say, I've been in the business 24 years, but I took two years off. So that's why I'm always going back and forth between 22 and 24. Um, when you're adding up the numbers, I did it in 22 years. If you add how long I've been in the business, it's been 24 years. Mm -hmm. I was laying down for two of them, uh, figuring out that I didn't want to lay down. Um, so, yeah. I just specialize in seller financing or, or creating notes and collecting mortgage payments, uh, uh, not necessarily rent. Although I've collected my fair share of rent and I, and I do collect rent because I, I convert my wealth into storage facilities where that's all we're doing is renting spaces. But I really appreciate the time. You were a very good student. Um, you're a doer. You, when you got uncomfortable, you didn't stop. You, you would keep going. You would like say, all right, Mitch, I'm going to trust you on this one. <laughs> and you would go ahead and go anyway, even though you might like be reluctant. And there were other things that you just, you know, were willing to jump into like a lion. You know, and well, we're, we're, we're both alumni of the same university. La Calle you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really? I like that. You're the first, you're my first alumnus. So you're <laughs> my college. <laughs> Um, all right, man. Anything else you want to say to the new folks out there before, you know, maybe the people that need to reinvent themselves, uh, maybe they're contemplating a, a life change or something. Anything you want to say to them before maybe we wrap it up? Well, I, I would just, I guess my tip would be, it took me a couple of years to feel really confident to go out there and be an active investor. Meanwhile, whatever little money I had sat in a low yield savings account ready for me to go into business. So what I would recommend for people to do is go ahead and put your money with an active investor. Like go find someone who's already in the note business and be a passive investor while you're learning to be an active investor. So at least your money's not, you know, is, is your money is actually earning something. And at the same time, you're picking up tips. So that's really what I did is I, I started working with you know, established people to see what they were doing. And meanwhile, my money was earning something. So that's what I, I would recommend for people that are learning. Yeah, as always, though, do your research on them. Make sure the people that you're learning from or that you're lending to or that you're in business with are the kind of person that you want to be on and off the field. Because mm -hmm. very hard to, they may look separate, but they're not separate. Somewhere it all turns into a big gray mesh. All right. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for stopping by to get you some Nomi Ya and check out her book, man. Notes to notes. Wait, Pretty I do have a little gift, right? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. We're going to give away, you have, you're going to give away to anybody who wants a digital copy of this. I just want you to go to reinvestorsummit.com forward slash Nomi and then we'll get you over to the show notes and there. My people will get with your people, Nomi, and they'll have all the correct whatever they need to get their digital download of Notes to Notes, how I went from music to real estate. And so she traded in the musical notes for some real estate lean notes. And um, are you able to slow down now a little bit or, and, um, and, and, and enjoy a different pace? Or are you still building this business? I'm still building the business. Right now I'm working on an audio book. So I'm in my studio every morning uh, when it's quiet. Uh, I found a lot of people don't have the time to sit down and read a book. So I'm doing an audio book. 
Well, um, you know, a lot of people like to double dip and, and like me, I most of the time won't sit down to read a book. I did sit down to read yours. Thank you. Um, but, but I would prefer to just listen to it in my car and my 45 minutes to and from town. I can take in a lot of books, by the way, I'm coming out with my fourth book in the My Life in a, Ho a Thousand Houses series. So by the end of the year, I'll have out my fourth book. It's called My Life in a Thousand Houses, More uh, Thoughts and Stories from a Serial House Flipper. Oh, ran no, it's Random Thoughts and Stories of a Serial House Flipper. That's what it is. <laughs> so new, I don't even know the name of my own book. However, you know how I do books, Nomi? No. I all, and I have I go I go to 99designs.com and I have a competition and and they and they they build the cover of my book. Wow. The first thing I do before I even start, I have the cover in my vision before I type the first word. I say wow. I'm going to type this book right there and there it is. It's beautiful. It has my title that I picked out and it, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have one damn page in it yet. Not well, one. funny. <laughs> yeah, I actually designed my book cover. I did all of my own design and my own editing and stuff, but that's just because I'm crazy. But um, yeah, no, I designed my book cover first too, because I was like, I want to be able to start promoting it, so I need to have the image. No, I, 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 I did, I'm not smart enough to do it to start promoting ahead of time. I did it so it would be staring at me going, what you going to do about me, brother? What are you going to do about me? Here I am. I'm empty. I have nothing in me. I, you know, so... All right, you guys, uh, I want to thank you for stopping by to get you some Nomi, y'all. I want you to make sure you stop by and visit TaxFreeFuture.com. If you do not have a tax-deferred or tax-free savings retirement account with checkbook control, you have no idea the, 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 the size of the tool that you're missing out of your tool belt. It's huge. It's gigantic. Go to TaxFreeFuture.com. Watch the 37 video vignettes there just to get a taste of all that can be done. I'm on there with uh, Tim Barry. He's a 24-year attorney who specialized in tax-free and tax-deferred savings accounts and the do's and the don'ts and the possibilities. So please go there. You will not believe what your financial advisors are not telling you. We're going to tell you what they're not telling you. We're going to tell you why they're not telling it to you. And then you can take it from there. Taxfreefuture.com. This is Mitch Steven with the Real Estate Investor Summit Podcast, and we out of here. Bye now.